In 2021, I published a history of social mobility called Snakes and Ladders, the Great British Social Mobility Myth. Most studies of social mobility are packed with statistics as if the story of social mobility is beyond politics and personal experience and is able to be condensed into a neat statistical table showing how many people have gone up and how many have gone down. I was more interested in who had managed to define some ways of life and some jobs as superior to others and what this meant to all the people who travelled across British society during the past century. And because this was my focus, at the beginning of the book, I placed a quotation that had echoed around my head as I wrote. That quote is from the socialist intellectual Raymond Williams, and it is this. Experience isn't only what happened to us, it's also what we wanted to happen. That quote is taken from Williams' autobiographical novel, Border Country, which was published in 1960. The protagonist in the novel is, like Williams, from a Welsh working class family, but he has become a university lecturer in the south of England. In the course of the novel, he comes to realise that he hasn't got to where he is by escaping his background, but by using the cultural riches he inherited from a community characterised by solidarity and the hope that solidarity can bring. He's inherited other things too that speak to the harder side of working class life, a knowledge of deep, often unspoken unhappiness and despair arising from political defeat, poverty and the thwarting of personal dreams. And in a rural community, there was also love of nature, but appreciation of its strength, ultimately an appreciation of the need to coexist with the natural world rather than attempt to dominate it. And there was tension between solidarity and the claustrophobia that small communities or tight-knit neighbourhoods can cause. As William showed, the need to move outwards from this community to realise personal ambitions brought rich gains, but those who did so incurred losses too. Put simply, border country, like much of Raymond Williams' work and like much of my own, is an attempt to smash the much peddled notions that working class people are ignorant, uncultured, or one that I've had to grapple with in the 21st century, that they no longer exist, having disappeared along with the mines and the steelworks. In Snakes and Ladders, I trace the importance of the labour movement in creating culture in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The demand for adult education grew out of men and women's thirst for knowledge and a wide ranging knowledge at that. They wanted to know about the history of their own communities and the socialist movement, but they also wanted to discuss Dickens, Shakespeare, philosophy, art. Later in the 1970s, when feminists began to point out that women made culture too, it was the Workers' Educational Association founded by the labor movement and not the elite universities that first introduced women's studies courses and women's history. There was and is no single working class culture jostling in opposition to highbrow culture. The kind of culture of which I write always arises from material life, from the experience of industrial work, poverty, or being born a woman into a sexist society. But the art, writing or cinema produced from those experiences doesn't only speak to those who have had the exact same experience as the producer. Culture can provide a map to solidarity, helping to forge connections across different social and political locations, providing that burst of recognition that you too feel those deep emotions, have experienced that fate, dreamt the same dream. In 2012, the working class playwright Sheila Delaney died. She was best known for her play A Taste of Honey, which she wrote as a teenager in Salford in 1958. It's the story of a single mother and her teenage daughter who herself becomes pregnant during a brief relationship with a black sailor. I decided to write Sheila Delaney's biography, partly because I found the obituaries so frustrating. On the one hand, they accused Delaney of not having written A Taste of Honey herself, a claim that's been made by critics wrongly since the 1950s. They simply couldn't believe a working class woman was capable of producing a masterpiece. But on the other hand, the obituary writers wondered where today's Sheila Delaney's might be, not recognising that their inability to see young working class people as more than savages, 
the word used by one critic to describe Sheila back in the 50s, might not exactly help young people to realise their dreams. What made, the di what made the difference to Sheila Delaney and to many of the so-called angry young novelists and filmmakers who followed in her wake was the availability of local opportunity. There were local newspapers, regional television channels and city theatres where they could cut their teeth. For Sheila, it was the existence of a radical socialist theatre in the form of Joan Littlewood's theatre workshop that made it possible for her play to be staged in London and become a box office hit. Those opportunities aren't there today, but the next generation of Sheila Delaney's are there if anyone cares to look. In her old stomping ground, Mad Theatre Company, Salford Lads Club and Salford Arts Theatre give a home and a voice to plenty of talented young people, and the same can be said of many other areas of our country. Culture, as Raymond Williams once said, is ordinary. It arises from everyday life, but it is also extraordinarily radical. Think of the miners' banners that still appear each year at the Durham Miners' Gala. On one side of many of the banners is a picture of the colliery as it is or was when the banner was made. On the other is the picture of the world we want to come. We are living through some hard times at the moment, and it's worth remembering that many of those banners were created before 1939, in times of great hardship, a lack of democracy and the threat of fascism. No one knew then that socialist and feminist aspirations for free health care and education could be achieved. It was a dream, not one with precedent, not one that came out of a focus group. It was a dream that led to the 1945 welfare state, a welfare state that gave many young people, Sheila Delaney among them, chances that their parents had never had. How do we find those talented people and give them their chance? Everybody has the potential to make and enjoy culture. So we need more funding for adult education, not only because many people don't fulfill their potential at school, but because we wanna know different things and do different things as we get older. We need to break down the artificial division between community arts and professional initiatives by giving space on BBC TV and the BBC's internet platform to local groups and by inviting women's groups, WEA classes and trade unions to curate exhibitions in our national galleries and museums. And our children should grow up knowing that girls are as capable as boys and migrants and black British people as capable as those who were white and British born, not least by studying women's history and black history. This hasn't been achieved by so-called diversity initiatives in the 21st century because they simply fail to address the causes of racism and sexism. It's time to rediscover our history, including the culture and campaigns of earlier feminists, like the 1970s women's liberation movement, who argued against sex stereotypes and racial stereotypes and for equal pay, equal treatment at work and in education and liberation from oppression not simply tolerance of diversity. And following the lead of Southall Black Sisters, who have argued this since the 1980s, our culture should not simply celebrate diversity, but in the wake of a new wave of religious fundamentalism, must stand up for the universal values of freedom from violence, freedom of expression, and solidarity with those who are oppressed by the lack of those rights. Culture translates individual dreams and disappointments into collective experiences, explaining where they come from and where they might take us. It's a reminder that we're not alone. We are not solely responsible for our fate, but we might use our disappointments and defeats, as well as our achievements and victories, to weave a better life for the future. As the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War once put it back in 1936, reality and dreaming are different things because dreams are nearly always the predecessor of what is to come. <laughs>